me start. Um, Laura, I'm going to ask you five questions. You can answer them as you see fit or not answer them. The five questions are, where were you born? Where'd you go to high school? Where'd you go to undergrad and what'd you study? Where'd you get your medical degrees and then your uh, residencies and all that good stuff? And when did you come to UW-Madison? So all right. Well, where were you born? Yeah, so I was actually born um, technically in Urbana, Illinois, but um, essentially I grew up in a town in Illinois called Pasodum, Illinois, which is a 600 person farming town um, that's about 20 minutes south of Champaign, Urbana. And so grew up in small town America in like a German farming family predominantly. Um, and so I went to high school there, which was Unity High School, um, which was like a, a high school that was about 120 people per class that you knew since you were age five. So there was that. Um, and then I ended up kind of staying close to home for undergrad. Um, I'm the baby of the family. And so all my nieces and nephews were very young at the time. And so I decided to stay a little bit closer to home so I could go to sports events and and, and be there for a little while. Um, and so I went to Illinois Westland, which is like a liberal arts college in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, and I did a major in biology and a minor in history um, because and I love history and I love science. I love all of the whole gamut. Um, but it's a little bit harder to make money in history, unfortunately. And so uh, I went the whole medical school route um, and my sister was a doctor, but she was the first one in our family. And so she kind of got me interested in being a physician, um, but I was always interested in science. And so uh, I went to Ohio State for med school, which was uh, a kind of random choice. I interviewed all across the country um, and actually thought I wanted to go out East uh, but I love the interview for whatever reason. I love the interview and I love their program. Um, and I was going to use it as like a safety school and a, and a practice interview. And then I was like, oh crap, I want to go here. So, uh, so then I went there, um, even though it's Ohio state, I'm sorry guys. Um, and so I was at U of I area and then I went to Ohio state. Uh, and then uh, I went to University of Utah for a residency for radiology. Um, and that was, uh, I was kind of choosing again between all over the country, um, but Utah had a really good program for education, radiology education. And they had a lot of programs that were developed to uh, teach medical students. And so I kind of wanted that for four years. Um, and then it had the added bonus, bonus of mountains, which I did not grow up with. I grew up with as flat as you can get. So that was a nice little change. Um, and then I went to a University of California, San Francisco for my neuroradiology fellowship. Um, and that was to do a little bit of a change on the science perspective. I had started doing research during med school and during residency. Um, but like I said, I went to Utah for more education. Um, so they did a little bit less prospective research. I did some there, but I wanted to go to either um, like a Massachusetts general or a UCSF type program that was a little bit bigger, more prospective research, um, and a little bit more nationally known for that. And so to get that experience, I went to UCSF, um, and did more vascular research there. I, uh, and long, super long story short is that um, I actually interviewed for fellowship at UW um, because I was recommended to do so um, as a place that I might like and they thought would fit with my personality. Um, and gosh darn, they were right. And so I, I ended up interviewing uh, for fellowship. Um, and luckily people liked me enough during my fellowship interview that they asked me like, you know, are you planning on potentially coming here? I was like, no, but I really like you. I would love to have a job someday. And so luckily they, uh, they contacted me while I was at fellowship um, and said that they had a job available. And it happened to be somebody that was retiring that does almost exactly the same research that I was doing at that point in time. Um, and I, had, I, I knew this man um, and I had met him at meetings and we had talked about our research. And so uh, I was lucky. I was really, really lucky. And it just worked out. The timing worked out really well. Um, and I love the people at UW, outstanding people, great research program. Um, and this guy set up a 30 year vascular research program and then he retired and handed it off to me. So how, how good can you get? So, uh, yeah, I was, I was lucky, lucky dog on multiple levels. So that's, that's kind of my story. Very good. Glad, uh, Wisconsin was able to lure you back to the Midwest. Yep. It's a little bit more affordable in San Francisco. 
Yeah, plus the ice fishing is better. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. Well, thank you for giving us that. That's a pretty great saga. And I'm delighted that you're here for Plato Frontiers and Life Sciences. And you can start with your presentation anytime you'd like. Right. Um, I think I've made you a co-host. Yep. And so All if you right. want to share your screen and I'll mute and everybody else can mute. And if you, do you mind if they, if people unmute and chime in with any questions? Sure. Yeah. I would love, I would love people to, um, if you have any questions as we go, please definitely interrupt me. Um, I would love it to be a discussion. I kind of made this talk as, you know, there's definitely a lot about the research area of dementia and Alzheimer's disease and the role of vascular disease in it. But I also wanted to give kind of an introduction since I'm a clinical neuroradiologist to like MRI imaging and kind of what we look at as a neuroradiologist too. Um, so please, if you have questions about the research, awesome. If you have questions about clinical MRI, also happy to answer all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, if there's certain areas that people have more interested in the future, I would be more than happy to come back and fill in those areas too, since it's only an hour. That would be great. And then if you've, um, uh, since you're not in at the hospital today, you can stay as long as questions run. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, great. we'll be good. All right. Thank you very much. And here we go. All right. Um, so like I said, um, today I'm going to talk to you all um, about MRI in general, so a lot of more of its brain MRI imaging, um, but a lot of that is going to be actually talking about Alzheimer's disease and really the relationship of vascular disease with Alzheimer's, um, which is my particular area of focus. Um, as I mentioned, I do a lot of vascular imaging, and so I develop MRI sequences that uh, look at the vasculature and different properties. Um, and it just so happens to be that, that vascular disease is closely tied to dementia. And so we'll talk about that today. And so as a little bit of an introduction, um, Alzheimer's disease is a really, really big problem that's going to continue to be a problem for the foreseeable future. And so it's the most common form of dementia. It's about 70% of all dementia cases. And there's really two main forms. And so there is a familial early onset form that's about 1% of subjects. Um, and so this usually develops before age 60. Um, and it's highly linked to a couple of genes. But this is, this is not the typical Alzheimer's that we're thinking of um, when you think of uh, family or friends that have this. And so what we're thinking about usually is late onset. And so this is what we call more sporadic. Um, and so this is 99% of cases, but sporadic is a little bit of a loose term. Um, it just means that it's not gonna have the same kind of uh, prevalence within families, um, but there is still some tie with family as well as genes. And so one of the genes that you might hear about um, out in the news is apolipoprotein E4. And so, this is a channel um, that actually has to do with transport with, within the brain and has something to do with vascular health in and of itself. These symptoms usually develop after the age of 70. And so this is just a little graph to kind of illustrate that. And so in that 65 to 74 year old age range, we're talking a very low percentage of the population is gonna develop true Alzheimer's disease from a clinical standpoint in time. But, as subjects get older, it actually, it increases with time. And so what we're really interested in studying is, is there anything that we can do to prevent that and or treat that? Um, and this is just some of the statistics, um, which is why there was a really, really big push in doing more Alzheimer's research about 20 years ago. Um, and, and it continues to be now. And so looking for any of those treatments, any preventative measures. Um, and so 50 million people worldwide suffer from dementia currently. And so nearly 10 million new cases are present every year. And there's a new case every four seconds, which to me is just astronomical. And really it's the only leading cause of death whose prevalence continues to increase. And so it's interesting in that the incidence is going down because, um, and it's thought to be going down because of the fact that people are living healthier lifestyles, but there's a, a population of people because, you know, our, our population as a worldwide has bloomed over the years and life expectancy has increased. So the actual overall prevalence is increasing and is going to continue to increase. It's actually estimated that in, in 2050, we're going to have 152 million people with dementia. And so, um, 
really in all reality, one fourth of humans will develop Alzheimer's disease during the course of their life. And so this is something that, you know, um, I've considered since I was in my twenties and trying to find ways to prevent this. And so this is kind of a graph to show where we're targeting for treatment. And so in theory, you're starting out clinically as having normal neurologic function, plus minus, I would argue that I'm normal, but some people might tell me I'm not, so you know. Um, but then there's a progression of what's called mild cognitive impairment. And so that's whenever you're noticing differences. This is whenever people are being more forgetful, but it's really not affecting their everyday life. And then, and then clinically people move over to full Alzheimer's disease where it is affecting their daily function. But we have those clinical designations, but in all reality, it's not like there's these cut points. Um, your brain is actually changing over time. And some of those changes are gonna be normal aging. Some of those changes are gonna be pathologic. And so we also have to suss out those areas as well. And actually there is a cushion. So brain changes are going on pretty extensively before cognitive function gets affected at all. And so what we're really targeting is this asymptomatic middle age group and really, really studying this as much as we can. And what we're trying to do is find biomarkers. So markers that would be at risk for Alzheimer's disease or true Alzheimer's pathology. And some of those biomarkers are in neuroimaging, which is what I'm more focusing on today, um, as well as cognitive measures. So if there's certain cognitive tests that people can get, you know, while they're seeing their family practice doctor to kind of identify risk factors. And so, as I mentioned, Alzheimer's disease from a clinical standpoint, meaning like without getting any imaging or anything like that, your doctor is just trying to diagnose someone, you know, you're going to have memory loss, but really the, the thing that pushes you from the mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's is the affecting of daily function. Whereas for mild cognitive impairment, daily function is not affected. The traditional risk factors for Alzheimer's disease that you'll hear about is age. Um, like I said, some genetic risk factors like ApoE4, which is actually, you know, a, a decent amount of the population will have this. Um, a family history of Alzheimer's disease kind of ups your risk. Down syndrome, actually. And so um, this is from the standpoint of true Alzheimer's pathology, where we think about amyloid and tau protein. Down syndrome, actually, because they have an extra chromosome, they produce more amyloid. And so they actually have this kind of um, progression that looks a lot like Alzheimer's disease at an earlier age. Uh, head trauma with loss of consciousness. And so some of the pathology, like the amyloid and the tau, tau specifically, is associated with having prior head trauma. And then also low education level. And so there's a lot of research going on with that. Um, is it because you know people with higher function are more stimulating their mental capacities at an older age, or is it actually the education at a younger age is helping things? And so there is a whole area of research on that. But what is the role of imaging, which is me? So my role here is, you know, in the clinical sense, I do a lot of research, but in the clinical sense, my role is actually trying to identify first and foremost, things that are causing what looks like Alzheimer's related memory loss that isn't. So something that can be intervened upon clinically more in the acute setting. And so that can be metabolic abnormalities, that can be things related to infection, neoplastic, meaning something related to cancer, um, hydrocephalus, which is just a fancy word for like the cerebral spinal fluid spaces of the brain expanding, so those ventricles expanding, um, post-traumatic changes, so somebody might have had head trauma, but they had never had imaging, so they didn't know how much damage was done, and you're actually identifying that. Um, and then also looking for things that are associated with dementia, such as the vascular disease that I've been talking about. And so from a practical sense, this was just a paper that illustrated that, is that they found that imaging suggested a complex dementia etiology in 21% of cases that were thought to be a single process. So answering the fact that like, hey, there's not just one thing that's going on, there's more than one. Um, whereas 46% of complex clinical differential diagnoses appear to reflect a single causal pattern. And so we're like ruling in and ruling out at the same time, essentially, from the clinical imaging standpoint. So this is just an example. And so I'm going to show you guys some example imaging. And again, feel free to tell me if you want to talk about it a little bit more or whatnot. But 
Um, and also, you know, if you're interested in any MRIs that you've had in the past. So 53 year old female memory loss, personality changes, pretty young, right? So like could be a familial type thing for Alzheimer's disease, but in this subject, no, not the case. She ended up having this mass here that was causing her memory issues. And so once that got taken out, it got a much better. And so that's something called a meningioma, which is a benign mass. If I had to choose something that's growing in my brain that it's not supposed to be there, I would choose that one. Um, 86 year old female with mild cognitive impairment. So notable memory changes, but not affecting daily function. In this case, this is those ventricles. So this is like that CSF or cerebral spinal fluid spaces in the brain. And this is the brain parenchyma all around here. And so these CSF spaces are actually bigger than I would want. And so what this is called is normal pressure hydrocephalus. And so somebody can get this shunted and they feel better. And so it's something that can actually be helped clinically. This person with memory loss has this signal abnormality in certain areas of the brain. And so this area of the brain is called the thalamus. This is called the mammillary bodies. And, you know, me as the radiologist, what I do is I put all the imaging findings together and I put their clinical history together and I tell them what it is. And this is actually something called Wernicke's disease, the thiamine deficiency. It's actually often associated with uh, drinking too much. So you can see it in Wisconsin. Um, and so this is one of those things that's going on. Um, this is a 85 year old male with dementia and ataxia and startle abnormality. And they actually have some abnormal signal involving their brain cortex over here and over here. And so this is actually, oops, sorry. This is actually something called Kronstadt-Jakob disease, which is actually on the sporadic form of mad cow disease. So again, all of these things were not Alzheimer's, but we answered a question as to what was going on. From my standpoint as a clinical approach, I'm gonna use all my imaging tools. And so I'm gonna go a little bit through what MRI is, um, and then a couple of the different sequences that we use just to kind of educate. Um, but essentially what we're going to be looking at in the brain is we're gonna be looking at the brain volumes. Um, we're also going to be looking at what specific areas of the brain are affected, um, as well as any ancillary findings with that. And so every radiologist loves this joke about MRI, but like, this is the one where they say like, we're going to find out your cause for claustrophobia by sticking you in a small noisy tube. So um, some people like MRI, some people don't, but essentially what an MRI is, it's a huge magnet. And so um, all MRI systems rely on a main magnetic field. So you end up getting slid in on a table into this big tube that makes a lot of noise. And once you're in that area, even when you're ever stepping into the MRI room, part of the reason why you get screened before you go in there for any metal, for any pacemakers, anything like that, is even outside of the room, you're getting affected by the magnet. It's strong. And so it can actually affect metal and pull things towards it. And, and then we're actually using those metal properties to do imaging. And so where does MRI signal come from? It actually comes from hydrogen atoms within your body. And so um, there's different property of hydrogen atoms depending on what chemical structures they're bound to. And so you have this big magnetic field that's in a certain orientation that you're sliding into. And whenever you're out in daily life, like me sitting here now, my hydrogen atoms are pointing in all different random directions. And in theory, they're all randomly distributed, maybe slightly with the Earth's magnetic field, but not noticeably so. Whenever you're slid into the superconducting magnet, you know, there is still randomness, which is like this part over here on the right part of the screen. There's still randomness going on, but more of those hydrogen atoms are gonna start aligning with the magnetic field. And so with that, we give the person a little bit of time with that orientation where they start to orient with the magnetic field. And then we start doing things to them. So whenever you hear buzzing in the MRI machine, what we're actually doing is affecting that magnet in different ways. And so we're causing those hydrogen atoms to flip in different ways and then waiting for them to relax back to normal and imaging at different points in time. And people that are much smarter than I am, MRI physicists, develop those sequences in order to do that. And so there's different weighting of sequences, different sequences make different sounds. And so why do you have to image for 45 minutes or an hour sometimes? Is because every time that sound changes, we're imaging something else in the body and we're focusing on some other area. And so one of those things is called T1 weighting. Um, and so this is whenever we 
flip those hydrogen atoms somewhere to the side and we actually wait for them to go back towards the magnetic field, the, the one that we originally talked about. And so with that, we get really, really nice images of the brain white matter and the brain cortex and the deep gray nuclei. And so the brain cortex and deep gray nuclei are the cells within the brain, the actual cell bodies. And then the white matter is all the axons. So the communication between different cells. And so with that, we get a lot about brain volumes, which is the first thing that I'm going to talk about with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so for these brain volumes, um, there's been a lot of research done on what is normal, because again, whenever you look at a child's brain that's three years old, for example, those CSF spaces are super, super small. Everything's taken up by brain. And then once you get to be 20, still most of it's taken up by brain, but there's a little bit more space. Same thing at like 40, 60, 80, the brain parenchyma actually loses volume. And because we're in a solid structure in our calvarium, you know, that gets filled up with that fluid. And so it's a give and take. We're in a fixed box. It's either going to be taken up by brain or fluid or something else that's going on. And so this was from the Framingham Heart Study, um, which is if you haven't heard of it, but a lot of people have, is a brilliant study that was started in 1948 that was looking at a specific town, Framingham, Massachusetts, where they followed people throughout their lifespan and now over multiple generations, and they've, they've branched out to being more diverse too. But they were essentially originally looking at cardiovascular risk factors, but because they were taking such detailed histories and watching people throughout their life, they learned a ton. And so one of the things that we're looking at here is actual volume. So calvarial volume, brain volume over time. And so you can actually see that, yes, that brain volume normally goes down with time. This is non-pathological. This is nobody had that has dementia. This is just normal aging. It's just what happens. Um, and as you kind of can see here for women, the brain parenchymal volume is always a little bit less than men. Um, I would argue that's because we more efficiently use our brain, but you know, that's my personal opinion. So, you know, um, that's kind of what it does normally with aging. Um, with that in the research setting, there's a lot of programs now that we can actually look at those brain volumes more quantitatively. And so from a clinical radiology perspective, a lot of times we're just going to comment, do we think that it looks normal for age or do we think that it doesn't? And we're pretty good at it, but again, like you have to account for male sex, female sex, um, you know, and a lot of other things going on. And so we're kind of, we're kind of eyeing it out, but now there's a lot of programs where they can actually look at that and it's controlled for normal age match and sex match controls. And so this is an example of people with early onset Alzheimer's. So that's like that more familial form. And you can actually see, so the red areas are the ones that have the most area of volume loss. And you can see that it's very, very extensive. The things that are preserved here are this strip right here, which happens to be like the sensory and motor cortex, um, that like actually what you're, you're feeling things, anytime that you're feeling things, it's going to the sensory cortex. And anytime that you're moving around, that's you sending messages from your, your motor cortex. Um, and then there's also this area here around the anterior cingulate. Those are the ones that are spared, but most of the brain's involved. Very different pattern from late onset, more sporadic Alzheimer's disease, where you can see that more this part here on the side of the brain called the temporal lobe is affected. The hippocampus is affected, which is literally the part of the brain that's most involved with memory, um, as well as this area back here, which is more like the posterior cingulate area. And so we actually very specifically study where those areas of volume loss are. And so, yeah, certain areas of volume loss, like temporal lobe, parietal lobe, things can point us towards Alzheimer's disease, but there's other disease processes that are going to be different patterns of volume loss. So that's one of our many tools. Um, and this is just a clinical example. And so this is a 73 year old male with mild cognitive impairment. So again, that's memory abnormality, but they can still have daily function that's preserved. Um, so in this one, you can actually see like the brain volumes are pretty good. You know, this is those CSF spaces, they're, they're not too bad, but there's this one area around here. And so like, this is that temporal lobe in the side of the brain. Um, and this is the hippocampus. So this little structure right here is the hippocampus. You can actually see where that's getting really darn thin. And so they're having focal volume loss right in those areas, which is a pattern that's typical for Alzheimer's disease. And so for this subject, they haven't clinically made it to Alzheimer's disease, but because we're seeing this pattern of volume loss, we're very concerned that this is true Alzheimer's disease and they're kind of progressed to that. 
this is a person again with mild cognitive impairment, different subject. Um, when they're 61 and when they're 61, they look pretty darn good. Would I be happy with this brain at age 61? Yep. Totally take it. It'd be great. But once they're getting to age 64, is there something going on there? Not really sure. 69, you're definitely seeing more volume loss there. And by, by the time they get a little bit older, there's definitely more focal loss around that hippocampus. And so imaging over time can help us for sure. Um, and this is part of the thing that we do at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center is we actually are following subjects that their families have a history of Alzheimer's disease. And we start following them in their 40s um, and actually look at them way over time, both from the standpoint of imaging, cognitive impairment, doing tons of different testing on them to monitor which people actually truly flip to Alzheimer's disease and which people don't and which kind of risk factors can lead them to that. All right, um, this is just another program to show you kind of how we do segment out that brain and get those volumes. And so there's, there's um, artificial intelligence programs that can actually identify different brain regions and then give us those volumes. They're not perfect, but they're getting better and better. And so it does actually save us a lot of time. And so this is called NeuroQuant. This is one that we actually use clinically and we will like use on our clinical scans. Um, and what it can do for us is it does do that age match and sex match. And so it kind of helps us make sure that we are quantitatively being good instead of just qualitatively. Um, and so this is a subject where you can see that their percentile for hippocampal volume within their age group is very low. And so that's not the only thing that we think about. We look at everything else on the imaging, but if the person's question is that they're having memory difficulties and they're at one percentile for their age and sex, I'm gonna be very concerned that it is truly Alzheimer's disease and I'm gonna relay that in my imaging, in my imaging findings. Um, this program does actually go through all the different lobes of the brain. And so it can give us kind of not only like very small areas of the brain, but it also groups it into like the temporal lobes. And so we can actually get more low bar patterns. And, and I don't look at every single one of the boxes. What this gives me is a general global idea of what's going on. Um, this is just one to show that like there are different patterns of volume loss. And so in this person, there was more volume loss more anteriorly in their brain. And this was something called frontotemporal dementia, which is different than Alzheimer's disease um, and has a different clinical pattern too. There's more behavioral changes with this. Uh, this is something called supranuclear palsy. And so this is one where the person loses more volume in their brainstem. This is specifically the midbrain here. And so again, we're looking at everything. If somebody presents with something going on from a memory standpoint, you have to look at a lot of things in order to make sure that's what's going on. Um, our another main workhorse, do we have any questions, by the way? I just kind of kept on going. Did anybody have anything so far? All right. Yeah, there's one in the uh, chat if you want to look at that. Ooh. It asks, how does Alzheimer's cause death? You could answer that now or you could wait till the end if you'd like. Yeah, um, I'm more than happy to answer that now. It's a really great question. Um, there's a lot of different ways. So um, if somebody progresses to being very, very severe in Alzheimer's disease, there's sometimes a problem with failure to thrive. People get to the point where sometimes they can't feed themselves um, and they just eventually just kind of slowly, slowly degrade over time. But honestly, a lot of the times it ends up being that something else happens. Somebody gets pneumonia, um, somebody breaks a hip or something along those lines. But that's kind of what it is. It's either that it's kind of a slow progress, a slow, slow failure to thrive or something that there's like a complication with something else going on in life. All right. Um, so uh, the second main thing that we're looking at is T2-weighted imaging. And so again, it's one of those things where we flip the protons in a different direction and then we wait and see that their reaction. And so depending on what it's bound to, different things happen with that. And so we, we look at with uh, T2 imaging, it actually really makes pathology stand out. So brain abnormalities, the T1 I often use for volumes like I was showing you before. For T2, it emphasizes parenchymal abnormalities. And so if you notice here, there's these bright areas in the brain here, here, here. And that's around those ventricles, those CSF spaces, but there's also these little spots out here too. Um, and those are called white matter hyperintensities, which is a very non-technical term, but it essentially describes that these things are bright. Um, and what does that really mean? to us. And so this goes back to that Framingham heart study 
um, where again, they were looking at vascular risk factors and the big summary point here, and I put the whole abstract, but just to, to show it, but um, essentially white matter hyperintensities, the more you have, the more likely you are to be older, to have vascular, other vascular risk factors such as smoking, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure. And so they are a normal part of aging, um, but they, uh, they also can be associated with pathology. Um, and so white matter hyperintensity is versus age. So I just told you that they are associated with vascular risk factors, but they are associated with normal aging. And so in that Framingham Heart Study where people were followed up for many, many years, this is the number of white matter hyperintensities in people that were stroke-free, dementia-free, and very low cardiovascular risk factors. And so the expectation is that with age, we're going to have them. If somebody has them when they're a teenager, I'm going to make sure that there's nothing else going on because I'm concerned that there could be something else. But if I see them in somebody that's 40, if there's a couple, I'm like, well, it's probably fine. You know, they might have a history of migraines or other things that can cause them, but they're probably okay. If I see them in somebody that's 60 or 70, then it's, I expect to see some, but do I think it's within the normal range of age? Or do I think it's something where the person has more vascular disease than normal or something else going on? All right. And how do we grade that? Um, there's actually a lot of different grading factors with that. There's a lot of different systems that we can do it. And so this is just showing like somebody with only a few of them versus somebody that has a lot. And so we can, again, use systems to actually get us volumes, or we can do different classification systems that are more qualitative, us grading them. And so um, are these grading systems useful? Very, um, but volumes are more sensitive. So from a research standpoint, we actually like to try to use volumes whenever we can. We do still do lesion numbers, we do lesion types, um, but volumes give us a little bit more sensitivity and specificity um, when looking at data. And the other consideration is, are they all the same? So like I told you, some of them are associated with normal aging. Um, and then some of them we have to be more concerned about. And when, when do we do one versus the other? Uh, um, one of the things that we do is we try to think about them as being a little bit separate. And so these ones that are out further in the brain are more associated with vessel disease, whereas some of these ones around the ventricles are associated with more benign processes. And so we do actually keep that in mind. And so it can be related to blood vessel disease, small vessel disease, like if you have hypertension, um, other things can happen too, um, like something like demyelination. So your, your connecting structures in the brain, like those axons are covered with myelin. If you lose that, it actually looks like hyperintensities. And so this is just a couple examples clinically of this is not normal white matter disease. And so this is what I do as a radiologist of saying like, I see this pattern. I don't think it's normal. This ended up being somebody that has something called catasol syndrome, which is a hereditary thing that leads to more strokes than normal. This is multiple sclerosis. And so this is an autoimmune condition where your body actually attacks that covering of those axons, that myelin sheath. This is something called Susak syndrome, where it's actually your body attacking the small vessels, um, the lining of the small vessels in your brain, leading to demyelination as well. And this was a very crazy case where um, it's called levemazole toxicity. And it's actually uh, something that's mixed with cocaine. And this person had used cocaine and caused brain damage. So don't use cocaine. That's the, that's the message there. But why, why is this all relevant to me and vascular research um, and dementia? You know, I'm, I'm listing all these things that are potentially normal, but can also be pathologic if there's too much. Um, this is relevant because in the last 20 years, our thought about vascular dementia has changed quite a lot. So originally, and even now in medical school, honestly, we're taught that Alzheimer's is the most common cause of memory loss and dementia. And then vascular dementia is the second most common cause. And so vascular dementia in the strict sense was if somebody has multiple strokes that leads to abnormal cognition. Um, but really this all goes together. So really the revised version is that a lot of this stuff overlaps. You know, people that have vascular disease a higher percentage of those people go on and get Alzheimer's disease and vice versa. The majority of people with Alzheimer's disease have vascular risk factors. And so my line of research is trying to 
figure out what that relationship is. Is it synergistic? Is it additive? Is it causative? Does having vascular disease young and age cause you to have Alzheimer's disease later? Or is it more of the relationship of vascular disease causes some cognitive changes over time and Alzheimer's does too. And so together it looks worse. Um, and then you have to add in the complexity of not all vascular disease is the same. And so you can have vascular disease that's in the large vessels of the body, like in the heart, um, the aorta, you can have it be in the large vessels of the brain. So the areas where it's like the carotid arteries or what we call the circle of Willis, this blood vessels that are around the, the more central area, or it can go out to the capillary level where, you know, you're in small blood vessels where there's only one red blood cell that can pass through at a time. And so there's all different levels of vascular disease and those things can be manifest in different ways. We talked about a multi-infarct dementia or having strokes that is a bigger area of the brain that's infected, or it can be things like the white matter hyperintensities where somebody has small vessel disease and they don't really have strokes, but it's like they're slowly getting little bits of damage in the brain or bleeds. So all of that stuff matters. Um, and the other thing that we have to consider is true Alzheimer's pathology. And so I briefly mentioned this before, but there's clinical Alzheimer's disease from the standpoint of diagnosing somebody with altered cognition affecting their daily life. But a proportion of those people identified as Alzheimer's disease will not have true Alzheimer's disease pathology, meaning that they won't have amyloid plaques present within their brain parenchyma or tau neurofibrillary tangles, which is these tangles present within actual neurons present in the brain. So now we're very lucky nowadays that we actually have some imaging markers of amyloid and tau and some things that like if you do a spinal tap, you can actually detect amyloid and tau. And so we can actually study more specifically true Alzheimer's disease pathology. And there's some arguments, even from that pathologic sense, that Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease are tied together. And that has to do with the fact that the beta amyloid in Alzheimer's disease is in the brain parenchyma, but then there's also amyloid that is deposited in the blood vessels in some subjects. And so actually having that amyloid present in the actual vasculature. So this is just another case example um, of an 85 year old with Alzheimer's disease. And so I mentioned before the temporal volume loss that can be associated with Alzheimer's disease. This area of the brain that's kind of along the midline, that's uh, the hippocampus. So there's a lot of volume loss there again. So this person looks like the typical volume loss pattern. And then we talked about the white matter hyperintensities on T2 imaging, and there's quite a lot of them in this subject. I don't want this many in my brain if I had the option. And so this is kind of showing that relationship here. This person has a lot of vascular disease and they also have the brain volume loss that looks like Alzheimer's. So in this pers personal subject, they're kind of illustrating my point that they coexist in a lot of standpoints. The other thing that we look for um, with Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease in general is little brain bleeds. And so you don't have to have a brain bleed clinically that, you know, is, is manifest. These can actually be asymptomatic or called micro bleeds. Um, and so if there's amyloid present within that vessel wall, they can leak a little bit. And so we have special MRI sequences called T2 star sequences um, that actually will pick up small little inhomogeneities or per, like abnormalities in the magnetic field. And guess what? Our blood has iron. So it actually really, really helps from that standpoint. So if you have any of those blood vessels that are oozing a little bit and releasing some of that hemoglobin, whenever those blood cells get broken down, that iron stays there. And so that's what we can actually pick up in these MRI sequences. And as that, we can use as an indirect marker of there's these little abnormalities in the small blood vessels. Another case example to kind of show that in an 85 year old female with mixed Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. And so this is those sequences looking at those white matter hyperintensities. And you can see that they have a lot, right? These are big areas where most of the white matter is abnormal. And this is what we call those little micro bleeds. And so in this person, I'm concerned about the Alzheimer's disease from the standpoint of the volume loss area. I'm concerned that they have a lot of vascular disease because of all the white matter hyperintensities. And then they're starting to have little bleeds in there too. And so then I'm starting to think like, do they have some of that amyloid present in their actual blood vessels? And so we try to relay that information and from the research setting that can actually help us a lot too.
And so that amyloid present in the blood vessels actually has its own specific name and disease entity. It's called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which literally means like in the brain amyloid in the blood vessels. And so, um, from this slide, I really want you to take away the point that like this is associated with Alzheimer's disease in 80 to 90% of subjects. And so that's a pretty big number. And there's actually a very big spectrum of imaging findings that I as the radiologist can see with this, um, but it's less for, you know, the, the understanding the relationship and more just seeing the kind of complexity of what we're dealing with here. Um, and this can actually go all the way to the point of some, in the rare case, people's bodies can actually attack that amyloid in their own blood vessels and lead to actual inflammation related to that too. So uh, this is just an example of that cerebral amyloid angiopathy and looking at a couple of different MRI sequences where there's different amount of that bleeding present. Um, and so different MRI sequences are, have different sensitivities. And so that's part of what I work on too is, is adjusting those MRI sequences um, in order to detect these as easily as I possibly can. However, not all microhemorrhages are the same. And so again, clinically, some of these are different. In the cerebral amyloid angiopathy, a lot of these, if you notice, are in the periphery of the brain, where sometimes whenever they're more central, they're from hypertension. You can actually get them from getting radiation. So in this person, you can actually see that their radiation line stopped right here. And so this part of the brain got irradiated and bled some, whereas the other side did not. This was from emboli, so little flecks off that went into the brain. Um, this was specifically fat emboli from a femur fracture. Uh, this was related to trauma. So the brain had some bleeds in it related to a, a traumatic injury with a motor vehicle collision. All right, we're gonna switch gears slightly a little bit here. So again, I wanna make sure that there's no questions related to the onslaught of information I just gave you so far. All right. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, cerebral blood flow. And so we talked a lot about the principal changes with Alzheimer's disease and dementia and what I look at in radiology. Now we're going to talk about the blood vessels themselves and the actual flow of blood, how much is getting to the brain. And so people with Alzheimer's disease actually have decreased blood flow compared to normal people of their own age, as well as people that are younger, but specifically to people of their own age. And so we can look at that from a radiology perspective in a couple of different ways. One of the ways is what we call perfusion imaging. And so this is where we actually look at the passage of blood flow into that capillary bed. So those very, very small blood vessels where only one blood, red blood cell can move through at a time. And so different sequences for that, I'm not gonna go into all of those specific ones, um, but we do look at this. This is one called arterial spin labeling is the fancy name. And you can actually see all these bright areas or all of those areas where, again, the neuronal cell bodies are, whereas all the dark areas are where those axons, those communicating axons are at. And you can see that the metabolism is much higher in the cell bodies. That makes sense, right? The cell nuclei are there, the metabolism is a lot higher. And so they require more of the blood flow and the more of the perfusion. So a lot of that perfusion is kind of siphoned off into those capillary beds providing those cell bodies. And so arterial spin labeling, I do think it's very, very clever. You actually use the MRI field to label blood flowing through the neck. And then we delay and we watch it go into the brain. So pretty, pretty fancy. I'm really impressed with people that developed it. Pretty awesome. So another case example, sort of the same things that we were going through before looking at brain volumes. And then in this one, you can see that arterial spin labeling where there's darker areas in this person in the parietal lobes. And so for Alzheimer's disease, it's kind of parietal and temporal lobes that are affected. And so this person has decreased perfusion in those areas. That can be related to two things. It can be related to vascular disease proper in the actual blood vessels where they're not getting as much perfusion because of that. It can also be related to metabolism. So whenever you lose brain volume, you don't require as much energy in that region. So you have decreased blood flow. So it's a little bit of chicken and the egg situation, but we actually do try to study that. We can also look at the blood flow actually present in those areas that were dark in some of the other imaging. So this is that white matter. So the darker area that gets less perfusion, we can actually try to map out those areas of perfusion as well. It's a little bit more difficult, but we do try to do it. 
The other thing, and this is one of my, my main areas of research, um, is actually something called 4D flow MRI. And so this is a very awesome technique um, where we actually look at blood flow amount in a direction, but we also look at the vector. So with that, we're getting the blood flow, but we're also getting directionality. And because we have both of those two things, we can calculate a lot of really fancy things that I just think are awesome. So we can actually look at wall shear stress. So the stress that's put on the vessel wall, we can look at pulsatility. So the actual blood flow, whenever it pulses with the cardiac cycle and how much that is pulsing, we can look at pressure gradients. So how much pressure is present in those blood vessels. Um, and then we can look at vessel area measurements too. So actually getting like areas of narrowing, um, which we can get with other sequences too, but we can also get that with 4D flow MRI. And so this is just one of those images showing us velocity measures present within those intracranial vessels. So um, this was from one of the papers that we wrote. Um, and so there's actually uh, the ability to look at vessel compliance. And so as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, we're trying to find biomarkers that are early. And so what we would ideally want to do is map out the earliest changes that occur in the blood vessels and then try to link that with the development of neurodegeneration um, and think about the mechanisms that are involved there. And so, yes, we can look at vessel narrowing, but that's going to be later on in life. One of the the couple of the first things that are going to happen in blood vessels is going to be stiffening before there's even narrowing or calcifications, atherosclerotic disease, any of those things. And so the blood vessel wall is going to get less compliant. Um, the second thing that you think about is with any alteration in compliance, you're also going to get abnormalities in autoregulation. And so autoregulation is a fancy term for your, your brain blood vessels are able to dilate and contract based on their metabolic needs. And so, for example, if you are thinking really, really hard about a math problem, you are going to need more blood to certain areas of your brain that are helping you work out that problem. And whenever people are 20, their blood vessels are able to easily dilate and accommodate for that stress. Whereas whenever people get atherosclerotic disease and are older, sometimes they can't compensate for that as well. And so abnormalities in that would be one of the earliest findings that we could have. And so with this 40 flow MR, we can actually look at that pulsatility. And if you think about it, if you're in a tube that is rubber and can stretch, whenever you send in cardiac pulsatility in, your blood vessel can expand and actually dampen that quite a lot. And so it's going to be less pulsatile flow. Whereas if it's a rigid lead pipe, that pulsatility is going to be hitting more dramatically and it's just going to keep on bouncing off of very stiff walls. And so we've actually shown that that increase in pulsatility is present in people with Alzheimer's disease compared to people with the mild cognitive impairment and normal age match controls. So people with Alzheimer's disease do have higher amounts of vascular disease present. We've actually even taken that a step further where we can actually directly measure the vessel wall stiffness in and of itself instead of looking at the indirect um, pulsatility marker. And so whenever you have your heart contract, you can picture it like your heart contracts, the blood gets pushed up to, into the aorta and your aorta contract like, is compliant, it opens up a little bit. And then as that pulse wave goes down your aorta and down into your body, you actually have a wave of expansion as you're going down. And so that goes into all blood vessels everywhere. As you get further down into your legs and things, that pulse wave is gonna die out, but it does go up into your carotids and into your brain. And so we actually are able to measure that pulse wave, how fast it's transmitted. And so if, you have a stiff vessel that's going to get transmitted much quicker up into the brain than a compliant vessel that's able to kind of absorb that pulse wave. And so we have shown that, um, you know, that pulse wave velocity, again, is elevated in people with Alzheimer's disease. And now we're taking that a step further. We've actually looked at this in people that are all cognitively normal. And so this is like in that, that age range when people are in their like 50s don't have Alzheimer's disease yet, but they have a family history of Alzheimer's and or Alzheimer's genetic risk factors. And so that's this group right here. And so these age match controls actually have more compliant blood vessels than people that are at risk based on their, their patient histories. 
Um, and so really what we want to do is understand how these very specific markers of vascular disease tie in with true amyloid burden and tau pathology. We can also look at multiple different brain compartments and so look at um, actual brain compliance as well. And so this is just a slide to start bringing up that question. Um, but again, there's multiple different techniques to do that with, um, one of which is called MRI elastography, um, where we actually look at that brain compliance. And so we want to pair together vessel wall compliance with brain compliance and how that all works together. Hard to do, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting clinical problem. I did want to give out a small shout out, even though this isn't my specific area of research, is to diffuser tensor imaging. And so this one is actually looking at diffusion of water with MRI. And so with that, we can actually look at those exonal tracts and if those are degraded. And so you can actually look and see if you lose these connections between big communication areas of the brain. Um, and also we're moving towards studying vascular disease and how it affects those tracts degrading over time. Um, and there's different ways to measure that, um, one of which is called fractional anisotropy. So looking at directionality of those axons and whenever those are lost. Uh, and then last thing before I move into pathology, I think is um, functional MRI. And so that's what I talked about with like, we can actually uh, image that metabolic demand in different areas of the brain based on what people are doing um, and how those change over time in people with dementia. Um, I did mention this briefly before, but um, you know we are talking about true Alzheimer's pathology nowadays. Um, it used to be that it was an at autopsy diagnosis, um, but now we can actually Im image amyloid and tau clinically. Uh, and this is done with radionuclides. And so this is PET scanning where we actually give people radio tracers. So they are, you know, radioactive tracers essentially. Um, and they localize to areas of the brain that have actual amyloid. And so we are actually diagnosing true Alzheimer's disease pathology in these subjects, which really puts our research years and years ahead because now we are truly studying Alzheimer's pathology. Whereas a lot of research that was done in the nineties and early two thousands, we were studying clinical Alzheimer's, but a subset of those subjects were not true Alzheimer's pathology. Different tracers can be used for this. Um, and there's also tau specific tracers too. And so there's the amyloid and the tau. Um, and so looking at the distribution of amyloid with aging, tau with aging, and then metabolism with aging, which is related to the glucose. And so UW is actually amazing. Again, I said I was really lucky to walk into such an amazing program. I was. They've been doing amyloid imaging um, for the last like 10, 20 years here. Um, and they've been following people over time. And so now they're getting to the point where they can actually map out whenever they think people started first getting amyloid based on the timelines they have overall. Um, and from that, we can, we can really start doing amazing research during that beginnings time points and seeing if anything that we're doing from a health perspective can alter the course of disease. All right, I'm gonna skip those for now. Um, dementia risk factors, which, you know, this is the stuff that's relevant to everybody now. Um, it's relevant to me. It's relevant to, you know, my nieces and nephews. What things can we do? Um, there's some things that are obviously fixed. Um, I would love to make myself younger sometimes, but can't happen. Family history, unfortunately, or fortunately, you're born into who you're born into. And so there, if you have a family history, there's not too much you can do about that. APOE status, again, that's the genetic risk factor, can't do much about that. Um, and also like any other risk factors like head trauma, can't really, can't really undo that. What's modifiable? Some of the things that we're looking at is there's a big association, like I said, with cardiovascular disease. So hypertension, managing that really well. Diabetes, trying to eat healthy. Um, having elevated lipids. So again, trying to keep cholesterol, all of those things down. Um, lifestyle choices, uh, diet, um, eating healthy is definitely one of those things that kind of goes in with the cardiovascular risk factors too. There has been a little bit of study on and the one diet that was actually shown to be pretty promising is like a Mediterranean diet. And so that's a potential thing, but don't hold me to it. It could change in five years with the research education activity, staying, you know, exercising active definitely helps, um, and staying engaged socially, um, with games and everything like that. So in summary, you know, this is a clinical spectrum. Um, there's multifactorial causes uh, that kind of moves it through a progression of clinical from MCI to dementia. 
I, as an imager, I'm looking at a lot of the structural patterns, but nowadays we actually have a lot of functional imaging agents and biomarkers that we're going to look for even more so in the future. And so I gave you the, the super overview of some of the research stuff. Um, there's a lot of really, really interesting things that we're doing there. And then this is my most important question is, can I still eat chocolate? You tell me all these things where, you know, I need to be healthy and all of this stuff helps. And absolutely, they actually did have a study that showed that with people with MCI, people that ate dark chocolate, um, had increases in their cognitive tests, decreased insulin resistance related to diabetes and decreased blood pressure. So I'm going to take that as my Easter candy still fine. So thank you for your time. Please, any questions, more than happy to answer it um, and or give you some other talk in the future. Well, I'd be delighted to take you up on the offer of another talk in the future, um, but we'll do that a little later. Are there <laughs> For like maybe at 2 30. Um, <laughs> are there other are there questions from people who would like to uh unmute and chime in and come on? Uh, Tom, this is Morris. Hi, Morris. I lost about eight of my colleagues to glioma at the Amico Research Center in Naperville, Illinois. Eight? Eight, yes. Enough that it wasn't a cluster. Yeah. We were all given the option of having free MRIs, which I got. This is uh -huh. about 25 years ago. Okay. Is there any research value into getting another MRI 25 years later? Good question. Um, do you mean from the standpoint of like, uh, I mean, normal aging type research or, or what do you, what do you, all of uh -huh. these? Up to you guys. You know, <laughs> other yeah. than for hoots, is there a value to uh, getting an MRI for research purposes? Yeah. So, um, you know, and honestly, for like for this type of research, um, and I can kind of go through what the the Alzheimer's Disease Research Institute here does in general. So the the kind of there's multiple different groups that we end up imaging. Um, we do uh, an ADRC population where um, we get a lot of referrals for people that have what they think is true Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's disease spectrum. So like that mild cognitive impairment through, um, but then we actually try to get age match controls. And so um, with all of these risk factors, all of these vascular disease risk factors and everything that I'm talking about, um, there are so many studies going on here, so many, um, and I can't even begin to tell you all of them, but we try to get a lot of age match controls from the general population. Um, so from the standpoint of you having one before and now, it's kind of hard for me to tell you from this, because I don't know what your old scan looks like. What we really need is um, for MRI scans, there's so much variability of the different sequences. Um, and different scanner strengths. So like there's 1.5T, 3T, um, but literally you can make a different MRI sequence protocol. There's infinite possibilities. And so what we try to do from a research standpoint is we try to have consistent scanning. So like having the same thickness of slices, having the same sequences so that they're very comparable over time. The problem with something that's 25 years ago is that the, I guarantee the technology was different. So like the MRI coils that were used are gonna be very different than the ones from today. Um, and I don't know what they use for scan parameters. And so it's one of those things from like a standpoint of like time point zero and 25 years later, we would have to do a similar scan or at least something where we can make the data comparable is the best way to put it. And so it's hard for me to answer that question offhand from the standpoint of like, if you're interested in um, research studies that are going on in Madison, we love age match controls because people that are engaged and are, you know, honestly, like the history of like being in research and being interested in this sort of things, like I, I love those participants because they are willing to let me sit there and ask them questions for three hours. Because here's where I, I get a lot of value is that I don't want just the history of high blood pressure. What I want to know for some of my studies is how often did you exercise when you were 20? How often did you exercise when you were 30? How often did you exercise when you were 40? 
what were your sleep patterns like? There's actually a lot of things with dementia and sleep disturbances. So people that have issues with sleep earlier on in life or like COPD or, or obstructive sleep apnea, where their sleep is consistently disrupted, there's actually a higher association with dementia in those subjects. And a lot of that is thought to be related to clearance of amyloid and how we're normally clearing it versus depositing it in our brain because we produce it during the day. And then it gets cleared. What it looks like is at night. Right. Um, so I love normal subjects. It's from the standpoint of, do I know if having two time points for you is useful from the MRI's perspective? It's really hard to say without looking at the scan. Um, but from the standpoint of like engaging in research, we love it. And we love it. Like when, like I said, people that have scientific background are some of my most favorite people to work with because they can understand why I'm nitpicking about like, did you get eight hours sleep every night whenever you were younger? Um, and so, so those are the people that are great. So I don't know if that answers your question perfectly, but um, yeah, it, it, from the research standpoint for MRI, we really need consistency as over time of the similar or at least comparable data. And so I would have to definitely look at your skin to see if it was good from the longitudinal standpoint, but from the, from the interest standpoint on research, like we, we always love people that are, that are engaged in science. It's great. Hey, thank well, a follow-up question for, for, for his question is how do the researchers recruit volunteers then? for yeah. age match controls? Yeah, a lot of different ways. Um, and this, I'll keep reiterating this, but it's because I'm really, really lucky is that they have a great program here in Madison. Um, so the Alzheimer's disease research setting and kind of, they, they study, yes, Alzheimer's disease, but they study all different types of dementia and they study normal aging. And so um, our volunteers, um, we get them from a number of sources. One of the ways that we get them is that uh, family members are often very interested in participating. So if somebody is, has Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's disease spectrum in their family, a lot of times the family members are bringing them in to get their scans and bringing them in for their research studies. Um, and a lot of times they want to participate too, because they're interested, well, why don't I have this, but you know, my sister does or whatever. Um, the other thing is we do actually do, like I'm giving this talk because I, I think it's a lot of fun, um, but we do give talks out in the community um, for education. Um, and then as a side effect, that ends up being somewhat recruitment because people get interested in getting involved and seeing what their own brains like look like and, and doing all these cognitive testings that can pick things up early. Um, so we do that. Uh, there is also, uh, they do do flyers in the greater Madison area. So we, we image people and recruit people from all of central Southern um, Wisconsin and Milwaukee too, honestly. Um, and there's a whole fleet of research coordinators, um, people that help with community outreach, all of that. Um, so there's many, many different sources. Kathleen, did you want to follow up with any other questions? Um, I was interested. I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I didn't ask. Well, anyway, you, you had talked about in vitro diagnosis being routinely done. Is it in vivo? Sorry. Is it routinely done? And how many of the different scans that you were talking about are routinely yeah. used in diagnosing Correct. Brain issues. Correct. Yeah, no, that's a great question. That's an awesome question. So um, we actually get MRIs quite a lot. Um, so I, I talked about like the current role in clinical imaging, um, which a lot of times now, whenever somebody goes to a memory care clinic um, or is seeing a doctor for memory related issues, many times if they can tolerate it, they'll get an MRI. Um, and a lot of times that's the rule in rule out thing. That's the making sure there's nothing else going on, um, making sure there isn't a tumor or anything else that's causing an issue. Um, and then we look for structural changes that would be uh, indirectly indicative of a certain type of dementia. Um, so that would be like that volume loss, looking for more vascular disease, like those white matter hyperintensities. So MRI is very, very common. Um, every once in a while when somebody can't get an MRI, they'll get a CT instead, but MRI gives us a lot more information. Um, and then 
Uh, I talked about some of the radio tracers, so more of the radioactive type imaging. Um, there is something called FDG PET, which is the metabolism. So it's not directly imaging the amyloid or the tau, it's, it's looking at brain metabolic function. And so what they're looking for is lower metabolism in those hippocampal, temporal lobe, parietal lobe areas. So in the pattern, which is essentially what we're doing with MRI, just in a different way, we're looking for volume loss and structural changes with MRI. In the FDG PET, we're looking for the metabolic changes. Um, but with some of the perfusion MRI imaging, we can get that information too. So it's just, it's tomatoes, it's like potatoes, potatoes, like you're, you're getting similar information, different sources. Um, those are all FDA approved. Those are all commonly done. I would say MRI is more common than FDG PET. For amyloid PET, where we're actually imaging the amyloid, that is the true pathologic feature of Alzheimer's disease, that right now is almost all in the research setting. Um, it is not widely used from a clinical standpoint at all. Um, it's technically not FDA approved, but sometimes clinicians that really want the answer for a particular subject will find a way to get them into our studies in particular to image them for those reasons. But a lot of times they're actually diagnosed with what's thought to be dementia. Um, and then they, they decide to enroll in our study and we can actually confirm that, um, we actually have another big patient base, our research base that is called the RAP study, which is all people that are cognitively normal, but they have a family history of Alzheimer's disease. And so that was that one study that I showed where I was like, hey, we're seeing this even before anybody clinically has any abnormalities that there's blood vessel changes. It's that group of people. And so we're actually imaging people in their forties and fifties that have a family history with this amyloid imaging to see like when the amyloid starts function forming in their brain before they even have any cognitive abnormalities. So that's, it's mostly in the research setting. And then the last one that I mentioned was tau imaging, which is radio tracers that are specifically looking at the neurofibrillary tangles inside the cell bodies, the other big marker of Alzheimer's disease. That is all in the research setting. That's, that's actually in the last like five years is when that's really like taking off in the research setting. And so what we're looking at from a research standpoint is the trajectories of that and what this is like our preliminary data. And we actually had a couple of papers come out in brain from, from Wisconsin in the last year, really, um, where they were looking and like, it seems like in the forties, fifties and people they're getting amyloid starting and they're starting to get this amyloid trajectory. And it seems pretty constant. And then a subset of those people will get tau abnormality. And whenever they get tau, their cognition dives. And so there's a subset of people that get enough tau that we're able to pick it up on imaging. And those people that are amyloid and tau positive do way worse clinically than the people that just have amyloid. But from a from a pathologic standpoint, from the standpoint of like, if somebody went to autopsy at any one of those time points, they have some tau in there. It's just, it's so little that we can't pick it up on the imaging. So most of the, for answering your question, most of the amyloid and tau imaging confirming true Alzheimer's disease pathology without a doubt is in the research setting at this point in time. And we needed a lot more data with that. The hope is that really honestly, Wisconsin is one of the biggest data sets. The hope is that we're able to pull more of those into the clinical setting where we can diagnose people with more true Alzheimer's disease, um, and so then we can tighten up our research and actually really, really go after those risk factors of true Alzheimer's disease. And then you. You, um, the reason I was astonished about the in vivo diagnosis is because my uh, father-in-law died just six years ago. And at the time there, they told us there was no way except for um, an autopsy to confirm a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Um, so am I correct. And, I, and I'd be able to say, no, actually, you can get a good diagnosis for Alzheimer's from an MRI. You don't have to wait to die. Well, from not an MRI, MRI, it's still going to be indirect things. I can give you a pretty good likelihood, um, but I won't be perfect. So I'm not, whenever I'm doing MRI, I'm not specifically seeing the, the amyloid and tau pathology. I'm looking at indirect signs. I'm trying my best. For the PET amyloid and the PET tau, you can actually truly diagnose this. And so like, that's not MRI itself. That's, that's a nuclear medicine study. Um, 
but like I said, those are still not FDA approved. And so your physician was correct if they had phrased it as clinically, like in the clinical setting, we are not able to like confirm, confirm. However, if your, you know, relative was referred to a research place where they could get an amyloid or a tau pet, then they could truly confirm it. So it's possible. It's just not routine yet because it's Correct. not approved by the FDA, but Correct. it is possible to use in pet, not MRI. Correct. Yeah, um, that is definitely true. Um, and, and hopefully it looks like, some, like I said, at least one of the, the amyloid tracers looks like it'll get more co common clinical use in the near future, which will be usually helpful, I think, for a lot of people. Um, the reason why I think that it's, it's so awesome from the research standpoint is that whenever people are testing out like drugs for removing amyloid and tau and trying to actually deal with the true pathology, now we can actually truly monitor who has Alzheimer's versus not. Whereas, like I said, a subpopulation, we were treating somebody that didn't have Alzheimer's and we were labeling it as such. So it's really tightening up the research a lot and it's giving us ways to monitor disease progression and, and treatment interventions. Does it actually do anything? So it's a really exciting time for this type of research. And yeah. hopefully, hopefully we can actually impact care. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Is there a link between depression and Alzheimer's? That is an awesome question. I'm, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, so yes, um, there's actually a lot of research going on now as to the role of anxiety, depression, um, the role of mental trauma, um, and all of those things at different stages in life. Um, and so it, it, your question, it can be twofold. There's definitely, when people get Alzheimer's, they get a lot of emotional changes that occur. So people with Alzheimer's have higher rates of depression. Once they get Alzheimer's, they get higher rates of anxiety. They have personality changes. They have emotional liability. All those things happen with the cognitive changes. But from a research standpoint, there actually is a link with early life depression, early life anxiety, early life, essentially having hard lives, PTSD type things. And that like a higher percentage of those people actually get Alzheimer's than somebody that did not have those issues. And so there's something called the midlife study. That's a very big national study going on. It's called Midas. Um, and we're a part of that. Um, and we're turning in a grant on that soon. Um, but like, there's, there's a lot of research now that's trying to go and look at people in midlife and doing really, really in-depth history as to psychological history and where that goes. But early evidence is that yes, like early life psychological issues, abnormalities, trauma do have an impact later. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I had one. I had a you mentioned that that NeuralQuant software. Yeah. And um, it, it got me to thinking, you know, I was in machine learning. Is that like really integrated into standard like radiology curriculum for like, like new people getting into radiology these days? Because it seems like that machine learning is, is everywhere. Uh, <laughs> it's really pretty fascinating. I mean, you can't like trust it 100%, but it's, it's really fascinating. That's a whole other topic. Um, but yeah, no. Um, so... There was a, there's, they scared a lot of radiologists five years ago, 10 years ago, where they said, you know, like AI is going to take over everything. Um, there's a, there's a good role for it in radiology. There, there's some things that it can definitely help us with. So like, for example, like you said, neuroquant, it's something where, you know, you can take a large pool of data, people of normal aging, get brain volumes, gray matter, white matter, regional, all this stuff and, and match it to ages and controls. And then guess what? I don't have to worry about it. It does a pretty good job and it gives me numbers and it helps me very quickly versus me having to think about it for five minutes as to like, where do I think I am? And I might be wrong. So there's a definite role for things like that. Um, other, other things that I love machine learning for breast cancers, it's really helpful on mammography to identify tumors. Um, you know, it essentially can give you like a roadmap. It shows you all these different nodules and then you look at each one of those and make sure you think it's fine. So it saves time. Same thing for lung nodules. The lung is mostly full of air and the nodules stand out really nicely. 
where, where it fails. Um, and I, where, where I'm not worried about my job security is that there's so much complexity out there in the world, um, that like, you know, for example, you're talking, like somebody was talking about gliomas earlier, you know, once you start throwing in surgery and radiation and chemotherapy changes and all these different things, sorry, but an AI is never going to be able to tell me exactly where the recurrent tumor is and where the radiation changes are. It's just not going to happen. And so I think it's going to supplement and help radiologists and some of the things that are like bread and butter things that occur on a daily basis. Um, another really good thing it's for is like, you know, I'm talking about all this MRI imaging that's super, super complex. Um, you're doing all these fancy things with like hydrogen atoms and whatever. And then you do these really complicated Fourier transform reconstructions with computers, whatever, to get these really nice images. You can actually use that to save imaging time. So we can under sample the data and then use AI to fill in the missing gaps with the caveat that you wanna make sure you don't lose too much data that you start making things up. Mm -hmm. And so there's this really fine line. Um, and you know, that's where, you know, it's really fun to do research in the setting of, I love being the clinician and then I work with physicists and I wor or work with uh, computer engineers. And we try to put that all together and apply it in ways that we can in the most clinically applicable ways. And so we actually do use AI for some of that processing for like the 4D flow MR, because there's ways to optimize, you know, mapping out the blood vessels and the measurements that we're using and improving the reconstructions. Um, but I always, I always go back to this one talk that I had on AI where the person got up there and they gave this beautiful talk on like lung imaging and whatever. And like at the end of it, you're all excited and then they show this really distorted image of the lungs and you're like, it looks like somebody had scoliosis, like with their back kind of weird. And like, I'm looking at, I'm like, that's not right. Like, what is this? And the person wanted to go a word of caution. They had, they had taught their system so, so well and didn't show it anything else for years. And then they decided to just test it and throw their backpack on the MRI on, on the imaging and there's their AI then turned their backpack into a deformed lung. And so I was like, all right, well then. <laughs> like, so, so, you know, you have to, you have to be careful. Um, but, but it is, you know, we definitely have, we have AI talks in radiology. We have guest speakers on that all the time. We have an AI imaging group. That's a combination of radiologists um, from the radiology department and med physics and biomedical engineering. And we all meet together and discuss it and do projects and grants. So we definitely do all that stuff. It's one of those things where I think it's really, really going to help us in the field of radiology. I don't think it's ever going to replace us. Um, I just hope we can apply it well. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Paul has a question on chat. Do dietary choices such as caloric restriction or drug use such as statins impact imaging changes in Alzheimer's? Ooh, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think any of us do that for sure. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of things for like statins and vascular disease in general. So um, from that standpoint, I can give you some of my input. Um, so my research, yeah, I talked about MRI and Alzheimer's disease today, but I actually do um, all vascular imaging. Um, and I and I do do a lot of things with like uh, stroke imaging um, and carotid disease uh, in particular. Um, and so there are things with high dose statins and how that helps plaque stability um, in atherosclerotic disease and how it can actually potentially even help with plaque regression. So there's definitely changes related to the blood vessels that can occur with like high dose statins. Um, you can obviously change the course of vascular disease with dietary changes. Um, the earlier in age, the better, honestly. It's one of those things where, you know, ideally people would from the time they're, you know, a teenager, always be active and eating healthy and whatever else. But, um, you know, every change is going to be helpful from the vascular disease standpoint. Right now, honestly, we're not there yet. You know, that's one of those things where there needs to be, um, and there is actually, so one of the, it's called the spirit trial. Um, there was a trial done, um, I think it was five years ago, 
um, where they did very, very, very high, like very tight control of blood pressure in people over multiple years, super tight, way more than normal clinical. Um, and they were showing that the people in the group that were not tightly controlled versus the people that were, were having more cognitive changes in the sense of being bad. Um, but then there was another trial that came out that had equivocal findings. And this trial only went on for two years, if I remember correctly. And I could, I could always follow up and send that out to you guys. But um, they, I was amazed potentially that this trial was seeing a change in two years because for a lot of those things that are going to be more, I mean, like that's going to be a pretty subtle change in like the progression of vascular disease. Vascular disease takes many, many years to progress. And so if somebody is potentially seeing a downstream effect of vascular health in two years, that makes me say, well, crap, we need to study this more. Um, but from that, from that question standpoint, I, I can't give you a definitive answer. Every pattern of what I've seen is that, you know, having tight control of blood pressure, having really good control of diabetes or preventing diabetes, all of those risk factors are going to push you more towards having a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease, both from the clinical sense and pathologically. Um, and uh, we have a paper that's we're like submitting in a couple of weeks where we actually looked at the amyloid and tau and looked at some of our 40 flow MR features, like the ones that I was telling you about the pulse wave velocity, some of these very early things. And we were seeing like a more direct link. Um, and that was like one of our first, like, we are confirming it, not just in the clinical setting, we're confirming it with pathology. And so from that, we're going to branch into a ton of other studies. So I don't think we're there yet, but my recommendation to like, for example, my mom has Alzheimer's disease and like my recommendation to my family members is Hey, if you guys care, do aerobic exercise, you know, control hypertension, eat healthy, you know, do all of these things. Um, and there is some evidence that like higher, higher levels of aerobic activity are more important. So like doing things that are like, I'm going to go out and jog and keep my heart rate really high for even a shorter period of time is more impactful than more for a longer period of time with low activity. So like, even though I can't, 100% confirm these things. There's enough evidence out there that I recommend to the people that I care about that they do those things. Other questions? You mentioned um, the power of having a family history. For people who are adopted and don't know their biological family, are there genetic tests or other ways that people could get the equivalent of a family history? Yeah. So it's not common clinical practice. So you probably end up having to pay for it. It's not like an insurance payable thing. So um, like, for example, I mentioned the APOE testing. That's not something that's typically done, honestly. Um, and you kind of, my, my assumption, you know, my, my mom had just recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. I'm the baby of the family. And so she's 77. Um, but uh it's one of those things where APOE4, it's not some rare genetic thing. It's something where, you know, a good portion of the population is going to have one gene of it. And then a smaller subset of people will have two. Um, and the people that have two have a higher rate of Alzheimer's progression versus one, so on. My assumption is that I'm going to assume that I have it and that I'm just going to do everything that I can to prevent it. Um, but again, it's, it's something where the, the research is still at the, the standpoint where it's, it's really hard to argue for APOE4 testing just to tell you that you have a percentage likelihood of going on to Alzheimer's disease. There's such low penetrance. So like it's only a, a percentage of people that have APOE4, for example, that will go on and have Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't argue for insurance to actually allow that essentially. So, so the long answer to your question is not really like the you just kind of have to kind of assume normal, normal population risk factors. Sounds good. It'd be interesting if we can get the genetic uh, tests in the next few years that are more reliable or have higher penetrance. 
Yeah. And it's also, it's also understanding what a e 4 is doing too. Um, sure. There's a lot of, so it's a channel that's uh, present um, in the brain. And so it does actually have a, a component of vascular health to it in and of itself. People with a 4 actually have higher rates of vascular disease. And so we have to figure that out. Um, it also, you know, the brain, I mentioned brain clearance, but this wasn't that talk. Um, and it's a whole nother area is that the brain doesn't have a lymphatic system like the rest of the body does to clear the interstitial fluid. And so in the brain, there's no, there's no clearance mechanism that is recognized a hundred percent right now. And so there's a couple of thought processes on this, but one, of, one go ahead. I think somebody was just, uh, okay. Yeah. Included, but yeah. So, um, so essentially, um, you know, there's a couple of thoughts on like how that clearance is happening, but one of them is called glial lymphatic system. And so kind of this system of, you know, that cerebral spinal fluid bays, the brain parenchyma, it goes around blood vessels, it goes around everything. Um, and so that APOE4 could be in that part of that pathway of clearance. And so it could alter the normal clearance patterns of that amyloid. Um, and a lot of that makes a lot of sense to me. It really does because like, uh, you know, one of the mechanisms for thinking about clearance is that the actual capillary and small vessel pulsatility and contraction is actually helping to move things along in that glial lymphatic system. And so if you have vascular disease and stiffening, it's not going to move it along as efficiently. Um, the other thing is, you know, they're in a lot of animal models are showing increased clearance of brain metabolites during sleep. And so we honestly really need to study that in humans better. And one of the more exciting ways I think to do that is with some of the MRI sequences that we're using. Um, we have to adjust them, but we're moving towards trying to do more sleep studies and actually studying this glial lymphatic system more directly. But, you know, you're, you're talking about a multi-step process. We have to develop the MRI sequence and then start imaging it in the people and then confirm it in animals. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of moving cogs, um, but it's definitely exciting. Great stuff. Uh, Diane White asks, can low blood pressure lead to dementia or Alzheimer's? My mom was one of the, was the one in the family who ate healthy, no cholesterol or diabetes issues, exercised by working on their farm, and developed dementia late in life in her early 90s. She passed at 98, not from dementia. She had cervical cancer. So um, low blood pressure links? So far, so far no. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's if I had to... From the, from the stuff that's out there again, you know, with increased age that incre that you have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, it's just how it is. And so, you know, some people that are going to live perfectly and have no issues whatsoever are still going to get it. Um, and maybe eventually we'll know why, um, but maybe eventually you, you don't, there's just going to be an aging component to it. Um, so it's, it's a little bit complicated and, and I, I feel your pain in that my, my mother always weighed 125 pounds and ate super healthy and still does and always had olive oil and a Mediterranean diet. And she is on literally no medications except for like high dose calcium for her bones because she's always been so small and like, and she got Alzheimer's. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a multifactorial complex process, um, a component of which is just gonna be, you know, with age, we, we are going to have more amyloid accumulation for whatever reason. And so I, I think it's going to be many, many years before we discover, we, you know, more fully understand the multifactorial process. Hopefully we identify the biggest risk factors to decrease levels as quickly as possible, but there's going to be those healthy people that just end up getting it too. I have a question about early markers, uh, research on other early markers um, in spinal fluid or blood. Yeah. Yes. And that you, yes. And I had, I kind of skipped over that part mm -hmm. because I was running out of time. Um, but uh, yes, there definitely is. Um, so I, they've looked at amyloid and blood. They, they've, they've definitely been trying to do that. It's a little bit hard because, you know, amyloid is something that's going to be in the neural axis. And so, um, you know, it's going to be associated with the brain. It's a, it's a metabolite. Um, and then, you know, it makes a lot of sense that you're going to have amyloid and tau, at least to some percentage in the cerebral spinal fluid, that's essentially bathing your brain and down your spinal cord. Um, and so 
we actually do do this for like our Alzheimer's disease uh, research cohort is that we do try to get cerebral spinal fluid on everybody that will allow us to do a spinal tap um, because you can get beta amyloid and tau levels. Um, and it does seem to be a slightly more sensitive marker than the PET imaging I was talking about. And so you can actually pick up changes in the CSF first and then in the PET. Um, both are good. Um, both are great. And obviously the pet is a little bit less invasive. You don't have to use a needle, um, but they both have a very good role. Um, and we are doing research where we look at the sensitivity and specificities on a larger scale. So comparing those CSF markers with the pet markers, um, and, and there is studies specifically focused just on the CSF markers and the changes over time cognitively, all the same studies, just using different markers, trying to find the best role for everybody. So yes, um, and if we found a serum marker that was as sensitive and specific, that would obviously be amazing, right? That would be something that you could get as a test in your doctor's office, but right now it just doesn't, it's not there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then uh, John Talon is asking, uh, he says, I heard that DNA left-handed versus right-handed entries in the code um, can lead or is correlated with Alzheimer's. Can you please confirm this question? I don't know if I know that offhand, honestly. I, I don't think I got that one in my repertoire. Um, yeah, I would, I would have to look at the literature based on left and right handedness. There's obviously a lot of things with like brain function and um, and brain centers with left handed and right handedness. But um, but I, for Alzheimer's, I, I don't know that question offhand. Yeah, and I think this is, um, I'm, I'm thinking he's, and John, if you wanna come on and uh, clarify, but I think he's talking about left handed DNA versus right handed oh. DNA. Oh, gotcha. Actually, I think um, I, I had a, um, a qualifying exam. So it was a student who was working on this. Gotcha. And, and he s showed a picture of a DNA molecule where one or two, I think it was just a few components in the DNA, but there were stretches that were disarrayed. Gotcha. Pictures, and he claimed that it was related to... Um, Alzheimer's, but I didn't try to pursue it any, but, and it's not my even. Yeah. Favorite. It's not, it's not my area of expertise either. So I don't, I think I would be giving you false information if I gave you some sort of answer with that. I would have to, I would have to research that. Well, it sounds important. It sounds good. I like it. If it, if it works out great. <laughs> yeah. I haven't heard very many uh, biological functions yet for left-handed or ZDNA, um, but that doesn't mean they yeah. don't exist because I don't know that much about left-handed DNA, but I yeah. certainly like the idea of it because everybody needs to get to first base faster than if you got <laughs> right hand. Um, that's a very cool thing. I hope we can follow that. Other questions? And thanks for joining us, John. By the way, uh, John, um, Laura was from, did I get this? I'm going to mispronounce it. Pesodum? Yep, Pesodum. Yeah, uh, and John's at the University of Illinois, Champaign. Oh, nice. Yeah, no, I, I grew up in Champaign-Urbana area. Do these talks always start at one? Well, the uh, Plato Frontiers in Life Sciences starts at one, and they run for ten weeks. And I think you, I sent you a schedule, so you can. I think um, the last Wednesday of April is our last speaker for the spring, and then we fire up again for ten weeks in the fall. Wednesday night at the lab, which you're going to be speaking at it on April 20, 28th, um, starts at seven and okay. runs 50 times a year. I was worried because I teach one o'clock Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but um, that doesn't affect me. So impact me. Good. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Laura? All right. Um, or if you'd like to come back anytime next fall in the spring, whenever you can spare, I think, uh, this is a big deal for me. I think it's a lot of, uh, it's a big deal for a lot of us in Plato because, uh, for the most part, we're active retirees. Um, so we're at the age where it has our attention. Yeah. And if there's any, you know, please provide any like feedback, um, to as to like certain areas that you're interested in too. Um, I can try to focus a little bit on more on those. Yeah. This one, I kind of gave the intro to clinical MRI imaging too, um, but I can also go more towards a certain area of the research too. 
And I'm going to ask a personal question here. You can demur, you can respond to it. What, what did it mean to you and how are you dealing with the diagnosis that your mom has? Yeah. Um, so it was kind of interesting actually. So I, at University of Utah is when I first started doing like more atherosclerotic disease research, um, carotid disease research, um, which happened to be just by happen chance, like that was somebody that was doing prospective research that was really good at mentoring. And I, and I jumped on his bandwagon. Um, and I did more intracranial imaging, um, at UCSF that was more related to intracranial atherosclerotic disease, vasculitis, um, vascular malformations, but not specifically Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I was only at UCSF for about a year and a half. And so it was a short period of time. Um, but I switched. Uh, and I actually, I kind of suspected my mom had memory changes during the end of residency. So about four years ago. Um, and then definitely the first year of my fellowship. So, um, I came here a little over two years ago. Um, so about four, four and a half, four years ago, three and a half years ago, I suspected, um, but I kind of knew, you know, I knew Kat, Kat was out of the bag on her. Like, you know, if that's what it was and it was going to progress, like there wasn't that much I was going to be able to do about it at this point in time. Um, and, and so far, you know, a lot of the cl clinical trials, like there's a couple that look like there might be promising, but even with that, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to happen for her. So, um, but I, that definitely it influenced whenever I was going to come here, people suggested before they, like, I never mentioned that to anybody, but they did, they did like say, Hey, we have a really great ADRC uh, program here. And, and with the link to vascular disease, would you be interested in like getting involved with this group as part of your research? And, uh, and I, and I jumped on it. I was like, yes, like that is, that is very relevant to my life. It's relevant to my siblings. It's relevant to me. Um, not only is it a very exciting area of research where, you know, you're talking about a huge population of people you could potentially impact. Um, you know, a lot of things that we study that are very rare, like I study arterial venous malformations, great, but like, it's such a small population of people. Um, you're not talking about the potential impact of millions. Um, so from a personal standpoint, yes, it definitely, it, it adds a little bit of extra vigor to my, my personal life and, and this research. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a little, but from the personal standpoint, it's also a little rough. Um, I, I don't talk to my mom that much about this area of research, <laughs> um, because of that, you know, like she, she was a very educated woman. Um, and, uh, and both my parents were teachers and, and taught me, you know, I, I knew what algebra and X was when I was five, you know, like they're, they're that kind of teachers. So, um, you know, I, it's a little, it's a, it's a little rough. Whatever she asked, like, what is the most exciting thing you're doing right now? I sometimes don't tell her the most exciting thing I'm doing right now because it would be hard for her to listen to. So. Uh, well, it's pretty amazing. And, um, I'm guessing you're not the only person at the Alzheimer's Center who has parents with the disease you're all working on, and it's got to be an extra motivation, I'm guessing. Yeah, and also, I mean, like, I, I love UW. I think that all the researchers here, I think that they have their heart in the right spot. It's not just about, you know, keeping their job and, um, you know, having a paycheck. Like, all the people are really, really invested um, in the research and they're they're really invested in the people too. They're very aware that like the disease process they're studying is really devastating. And so they really try to give people the resources that they need to help in their personal lives too. Um, and they really try to be very supportive with participants and make them as comfortable as possible. Um, and part of it is relaying back the, the research findings to people that are participating in the families and really, um, and showing them what impact they're making. Um, and you know, the, uh, we also, like I did a conference yesterday, we do do conferences whenever somebody passes away that was a participant where the families can come and see the, the full course of their, their family's uh, present, like presentation through whenever they passed away. Um, and we go through the imaging and the pathology and give the final autopsy diagnosis. And we, we try to do it as you know sensitively and completely as possible so that we really show them like how this impacted research, which studies they were part of, what questions they were like their their family member was impacting the answer to so yeah it's a fantastic example of the 
public universities engaging with the public in a very durable, long lasting way. And I appreciate that. Um, I think unless anybody else has any other questions, I'm not seeing any in the chat um, and it's 240. Thank you very much for this extended Q and A. I appreciate it. And um, I think we'll sign off and uh, thank you again for the presentation, for fielding all the questions. And I look forward to, as Diane White just said, come on back and we'll get to see you in a semester or two or three, whenever you'd like to chat up again. Sounds good. Thank Great. you. Thank you very, thank you very much. much. Thank you, Laura.